TB Photo X1.5 TFX and welcome back to another video and uh, today we're gonna have a little bit of a recap on or rather the title of this movie is gonna be 4k on a budget well the thing is I believe that uh, now the, the past few months and uh, also uh, even the past year we've basically been bombarded with everything 4k or rather even longer than that maybe but in that way, the thing is, today, this year, 2016, has been one of the most, I wouldn't say polarizing, but we have seen both sides of the spectrum this year more than anything, because we both have the new school of photography where everything is the top of the line, you know, the people who use things like, like the Canon 5 DSR and the Nikon D5 and so on. <clears throat> so we have the, the polarizing and then on the other side we have the Lomography users who wants to use you know the you know really in a way crappy lenses and crappy gear just because they want to have that effect in the low mo effect in their vi in their you know films uh, and also film photography how that has developed I mean, if we're gonna just take a few of the things that have been coming out, I have a little bit of a cheat sheet here about what has come out in 2016 thus far. Keep in mind, I'm recording this pre-Photo Kina, uh, which is in a couple of days or weeks, uh, I don't really remember. But here, here are just a few things. In the start of this year, the Consumer Electronics Show, Ka uh, Kodak, excuse me, Kodak, came out with the announcement that they're gonna make a new Super 8 camera and uh, that they're really gonna try to market uh, you know those old Super 8 uh, films so that was a huge announcement for the more of the vintage community and then Nikon comes out uh, with the the D5 and the D500 granted when the D5 came out a lot. It got a lot of uh, you know bad publicity because of the three-minute 4K video capability. But apparently, if you do a Google search or a YouTube search, Nikon has rectified that problem with a firmware update. So now it uh, basically has 20 minutes of 4K. And the same goes for the D500, which is basically a D5 in, with a, a APS-C sensor instead. I mean, that camera has been more or less critically acclaimed to be a 4K monster. And then, uh, as an answer to that, probably, uh, Canon came out very recently with the 5D Mark IV. And we're not going to go in so much in the debate about that camera, because that camera has gotten a lot of negative feedback because of the on-sensor uh, anti-aliasing filter and the movie JPEG uh, for, uh, you know, carrier when it comes to 4K and so on. So it seems like the, I mean, it's not a bad camera by all means, but uh, it seems like Canon did some really strange decisions when it comes to that camera but we're not going to go into that debate but bottom line it's uh, very polarizing but a happy thing that came out was Hasselblad uh, showing a new camera and that they took the step into mirrorless and full uh, no medium format mirrorless at that with the X1D 50C which is a 50 megapixel uh, camera from Hasselblad that is now you know produced in Sweden in Gothenburg and it's a mirrorless uh, you know medium format granted a smaller medium frame but still <coughs> excuse me but then we had from China a very you know good uh, I mean a Chinese uh, optics company that has you know broken new ground in photography is Venus Optics with their lower series of lenses and they are probably the first to have you know put to market a wide angle macro if you look at Christopher Frost photography's channel here on YouTube he does a review of some of the lower or Venus optic lenses and 
even though they're fully manual and so on, the quality, the build quality and the quality in general of what they're capable of producing is, it's not subpar, it's really good quality. So check, check them out. And then we, if we keep on the topic of lenses, Lomography with all of their, you know, they've done some more kickstarters to get some of their new, you know, uh, old school lenses, you know, almost those type of Daguerreau style lenses that they have reproduced for modern DSLR cameras. That's, they're a bit pricey, they're also fully manual, but they are really quality things. And then Peak Design, new bags, I think they've done a backpack and a little bit of a handbag and so on. So they're up to their usual, you know, how to make the ultimate in camera bags. <clears throat> so check them out too. And then, uh, now we come to a, a little bit of the indie scene when it comes to, or independent scene when it comes to photography. The company New 52, which can be mentioned in the same circles as maybe uh, Cat Labs and uh, Impossible Project. Uh, New 55, no, not New 52, that's uh, the DC Comics. Uh, New 55, excuse me, New 55. They have made a monobath developer. And mono, a monobath developer is basically that if you're into black and white film photography, which I am, among other things, uh, you now have the ability to have just one chemical that does both the developing, the... Uh, you have both developer, stop bath and uh, the fixer all in the same solution. So New 55 has really cornered the market with that thing. And then a sad news this year, about six months ago, we got the tragic news that Fujifilm or rather Fuji not film, stop producing pack film, you know, the FP100. Uh, Fuji was the only manufacturer in the world currently that produced pack film for, you know, all those old school uh, Polaroid LAN cameras and all, you know, uh, medium format cameras that had, uh, po you know, were a, 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 with the ability to have a Polaroid film back. So that's a tragic news. But, Cat Labs has actually been writing on their blog that they are actually planning to start to produce pack film. So all is not lost for all pack film lovers out there. Also, I think it was a guy from the Impossible Project. Uh, I think he did a in he was interviewed by Majonju on his channel here on YouTube. Link in the description uh, about that. The Impossible Project were in talks with Fuji about making you know, some some kind of deal when it came to pack film. And uh, lastly, we have Ninetech, Neontech, who launched Pokemon. Go Wait, what? If you want my opinion on Pokemon Go, go watch either you know a, a college humorous uh, skit about it, or better yet, how to basic on how to catch Pokemon. But this is not what the major, what the head thing about this uh, video is about. Uh, I haven't start. I've started to look around a bit. You know, since we have been bombarded with everything 4K this past months and so on, with everything new that has come out in the way of photography, it seems like everything is pushed with 4K. That that's that's this year's uh, photography gimmick that everybody is pushing for. So, <clears throat> I started to look, is there a, you know, a, a budget-friendly alternative if someone wants to, you know, get into a vlog or a vlog type thing, you know, if there are any Casey Neistat wannabes out there who wants to start a vlog and they want to do it in 4K? Well, I was into, I was looking at Nikon's website the other day, uh, just browsing what was new, and I found this one in the most you know, unlikely place in the Coolpix lineup. And if you guys out there who don't know, Coolpix is Nikon's, you know, bridge type cameras. You know, they're point and shoot cameras, but also the bridge types. So then I found the Nikon Coolpix B700. 
Is this an overlooked camera with 4K capabilities? You know, I almost think so, because the only downside I personally can find with this camera, I haven't used it, but looking at the spec sheets, the only downside I can honestly say I find is that it doesn't contain a mic jack for external audio recording. You're, you're, all, you're limited to use this onboard stereo microphone built into the camera. But I'm gonna, I'm, I have on the paper here, I have the spec sheet for this camera. And I just want you to hear some of the specifications on this bridge camera from Nikon. It's a 20.3 megapixel CMOS sensor. It uses a Nikkor 60 times optical zoom. So in this camera, it's basically a 4.3 to 258 millimeter. But if you scale that up to a full frame or 35 millimeter equivalent, that would be like having a 24 to a whopping 1440 millimeter lens that is built into the camera. And that's the full frame equivalent. Uh, more of the lens, it has a six blade aperture. It has a minimum focus distance on, of 50 centimeters, so half a meter. It has optical, not digital, but optical vibration reduction. It has a built-in flash that is capable of TTL auto flash, uh, and it has an effective range of 3.4 meters. And <clears throat> it has, you know, some of the older Coolpix uh, lines, it, they only had the, uh, uh, the monitor for a viewfinder, but this actually has both a electronic viewfinder with 100% coverage with diopter function, and it also has an articulating 3-inch uh, monitor. So you can both use this as a proper, you know, up-to-eye holding camera with a viewfinder and you have a fully articulating 3-inch uh, display on it. And here's also a couple of features that I think is quite astonishing. It shoots both in JPEG but it also is capable of shooting in RAW, or NRW, which is a Nikon's proprietary uh, RAW style of shooting. And when it comes to video, it's basically, it shoots in MP4 format, or MPEG-4 AVC. It also captures uh, audio in AAC, stereo audio recording, and it films 4K in UHD 30p. If, if you look at Nikon's website and on YouTube, they have actually some test clips uh, with this camera, the, the B700, in 4K. And based on those results, they're quite good. And here's, the, here's another thing. This camera has an external monitor HDMI output. So you can plug in, an, within, it has an HDMI port, and it says on their website that it can be used with an external monitor. So maybe you can use this with an Atomos or something. So it also has snap bridge technology and built-in Wi-Fi. The native ISO, the native ISO is 100 to 1600 in manual mode, no, excuse me, in automatic mode it should be. And then in program, shutter priority, aperture priority, and manual mode, you can extend the ISO to 3200. So it seems to be quite the capable little bridge camera. So is this an affordable 4K bridge camera or, I mean, there is a, some uh, interview with Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones uh, when he discussed the entrance of the synthesizer and he asked the question, well, is it a tool or is it a toy? In this, uh, in this uh, instance I would ask Nikon B700, is it a tool, is it a toy or is it a gimmick? I mean, uh, put a comment uh, down below if you want, if you have any, any opinion about it, but basically this is very affordable because I looked at Mediamarkt, which is this big uh, German electron consumer electronics chain, 
and the price of Swedish Mediamarkt is 4,500 Swedish kroner for the B700. And that equates, using Forex, uh, to 445 euros, 500 US dollars, or 378 British pounds. So at least on paper, <coughs> this camera seems to be a great value for money. I mean, you basically can get three Nikon B700s for one Panasonic GH4. So in my opinion, it, I mean, usage, this might be a gateway camera for the, uh, you know, the smartphone generation to become interested in real, you know, quote-unquote, real cameras. And in that case, maybe features like SnapBridge, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi are good, you know, features to have. Because if you want to get the younger generation interested in photography and proper photography, at that, uh, well, you can still do great with low-end cameras. But maybe this is something to get younger people uh, interested. So, now I want to hear from you. Do you think this uh, B700 from the Nikon Coolpix line, line, is it an overlooked gem? You know, an overlooked 4K camera for future vloggers? Or is it, I mean, is it, what is it? Is it a tool, is it a toy, or is it just a gimmick? Uh, but anyway, this is Tobias Bergstrom from TB Photo X 1.5 to FX, and I'd like to see you guys in the next video.